Hello everyone, uh, thank you for attending this seminar. Uh, Dr. Lionel will present uh, his talk today. So he is a professor at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences and a researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, or NINA, uh, which is a nonprofit independent research institute uh, focusing on nature research and social ecological research. Dr. Lionel did his bachelor and master's degree at the University of Ireland and joined NINA for his PhD, during which he studied the ecology of roe deer. His research focused on the relationship between large carnivores and humans along several disciplinary lines, including ecology, anthropology, sociology, and legal studies. And today he will talk about conserving large carnivores in Europe and how much wild can we fit into human-dominated landscapes? Thank you, Ophelia. So it's a pleasure to be, well, not exactly there with you today, but to be online with you all anyway. So it's always fun to talk about kind of Europe to North Americans because I often feel that kind of, um, we always have these kind of stereotypic ideas of how the other side of the Atlantic is. So it's really quite fun sometimes to try and maybe break down some of these um, stereotypes. And talking about kind of Europe is one of my favorite um, topics of um, conversation, especially to non-Europeans. The question today really is about this issue of how much wild can we actually have? Because I think everyone is interested in conserving wild nature, but wildness is not like a black or white thing. It's a very long gradient with many different kind of degrees of wildness. And I think it's really appropriate to question sometimes how much wildness we can have and how much wildness we actually want to have in any given landscape. And in order to kind of illustrate that, I'm going to talk about large carnivores, which are often kind of viewed as being the most kind of symbolic species of wildness that we actually have. Um, just in terms of kind of background, I've always worked on large mammals, um, which are the cute, they are the cuddly, and they are often awfully controversial. So I've had the, the pleasure of working on many kind of different species from roe deer to musk ox to Asiatic wild ass to leopards and arctic foxes in many places in Europe and Asia, as well as kind of South America. But also over the years, I've been more and more working with um, people because as soon as you start kind of getting involved in wildlife and conservation, people appear and you simply cannot view wildlife isolated from the, the human setting in which they live. So that I generally have this fairly broad kind of international multi-species, multi-disciplinary perspective on things, which meant I never really become a specialist. I'm really kind of a generalist. But the context in which all of this kind of research has been happening has been kind of focused on, on conservation. And working in conservation is very easy to view things as like this kind of conservation science is a science of despair. You know, everything is doom and gloom and extinction and declines and everyone's getting more and more alarmist, portraying all problems all the time. Then kind of it's underlined with this kind of transition to the Anthropocene, right? You know, the humans are dominating the planet. And to most people in our field, and I think even in the public, this creates this impression of despair. You know, we're doomed, the wildlife is doomed, nothing's going to work. Fortunately, most of the planet's wildlife doesn't actually read newspapers. And there's an awful lot of wildlife out there which is actually doing its best to do its thing. You know, they're having their babies, they're eating their prey, they're foraging, they're living animal lives, largely actually ignoring us as best as they actually can. And it means that sort of, I try to view things actually as uh, the Anthropocene in a way, as maybe a, a sign of hope that because we control things, we actually have the ability to utilize that control to benefit wildlife. Sure, we could use that control to destroy it even more, but because we have the control, we can actually turn it around and try to do things well. So I try to view the glass as half full rather than half empty, and the Anthropocene certainly as a period of hope 
Um, a couple of years ago, we were sort of um, involved in one of these you know, multi-author papers that came out in science on animal movement. And this again is an example of that sort of, is it last half full or half empty story? Because it was very much spun as we're documenting that humans have an effect on animal movement. And sure, people do have an effect on animal movement, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, on one side, it's a bad thing because it's one of the many human influences. But the fact that the species were actually present in these landscapes for people to have an effect on them was actually a good thing. And in a way, the fact that the animals are responding could also be viewed as a sign of adaptation, that the animals actually are adapting to us so that they can actually persist in our human dominated landscapes. But this is sort of an example of the way I'm always trying to look for the positive and for the hope in human wildlife interactions today. So that my entire kind of, kind of research field is built around this question of how do we design an Anthropocene in which there is actually space for a lot of wildlife and seven billion people. Um, and this really, I guess, is kind of what is starting to turn into this kind of emerging science of kind of coexistence, right? So how do we and wildlife actually coexist in the limited space of this kind of one planet? So what I'm talking about today is an arena which I, I think has become a classic case study for testing the question of how far you can push the coexistence approach, right? And this arena is Europe. This is home to me. Um, over the last kind of 30 years, I've worked in most parts of Europe, all the way from the Barents Sea up north, right down to the Mediterranean mountains in the south. And large carnivores, have been the topic which I've worked on, on most in Europe. So this really has become that kind of case study of how well can we share our human dominated landscapes with iconic large carnivores. Can the Europe is certainly not wilderness, right? This is sort of a roadmap of the European continent. And if you look at that, there's not an awful lot of wild space there so that we don't have any large areas of roadless wilderness, okay? It's very difficult to get more than 10 kilometers from a road anywhere in Europe. In many countries, it's not possible at all. And even in countries like say Norway up north, we have incredibly, I think less than 5% of the country is more than five kilometers from a road. So the, this is a totally and utterly human dominated landscape. And it has been dominated kind of by humans for longer than any other continent. We're dealing with millennia of human modification, transformation influence on every centimeter of that landscape. At the moment today, we're like 500 million people um, living in 6 million square kilometers. So it's probably like double the density of the US about. Um, history is an important context, I think, in any kind of wildlife conservation. And the result of all of these kind of millennia of human impact probably came to a head in the middle part of the 19th century. That's when Europeans had pretty much trashed out the European landscape. Um, it was the peak of, kind of land clearance and, and deforestation. A human population density was massive and living largely rural lives. And wildlife had been pretty much hammered to the edge of extinction. And then kind of some things happened. And then kind of we started to offload a, a large part of our human population to the, the new world, which helped. And people began moving into a more urban environment because of the industrial revolution. So by the end of the 19th century, things have started changing. Um, the pressure on the land had become less. And this led to an era of dramatic increase in, 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 in forest cover, and also to the um, changing in hunting legislation and the restoration of the wild herbivores. So that kind of by the 1920s, 30, 40, 50 period, an awful lot of nature was actually coming back. The habitat was starting to come back and the wild prey species were coming back into that landscape. So today, 
for example, if you're looking at the wild ungulates, which are the prey for carnivores, they are doing really well. This is the sort of European map of kind of rodeo, which I guess is our ecological version of, say, a white-tailed deer. No, they can survive anywhere on anything. Um, red deer, which is the same as the elk in, in, in North America, have also come back to most countries and over huge parts of, of our landscape. Moose are back pretty much everywhere in Northern Europe. Wild boar are spreading all across South, Central, and Eastern Europe. So these are like the key prey species which have returned from a period of endless decline. Just to take a look at the scale of that increase, this is just a simple plot of the hunting bag of moose in Norway. And like going back to the early 20th century, they basically weren't there. You know, this kind of iconic species was just hanging on with a few individuals. And today we're shooting over 40,000 per year. And this picture has been played out pretty much across the entire continent. So that kind of just taking a look at say hunting bags in Europe. Today we're shooting nearly 8 million wild herbivores in Europe every year. So behind this then are populations of millions and millions of wild herbivores, which is really the necessary precondition for the return of large carnivores. So here we can move on to the main carnival story. And today I'll be talking about three large carnivores. The first two are ones which are familiar to just about everybody. The brown bear, which is the same as the grizzly bear in North America, and the wolf, which is a wolf um, on both continents. So these are species that you guys should all be very kind of familiar with. The third one is probably less so because this is the Eurasian lynx. And even though it's a close kind of relative of the bobcat and of the, the Canadian lynx, in our conditions, um, this lynx basically has the ecology of a cougar. It's a bigger than kind of your lynx, and it feeds almost exclusively on wild ungulates, like deer, um, roe deer, red deer. It can even kill juvenile moose on occasion. So even though I talk about lynx, try to just conceive of this as another version of a cougar or mountain lion. Um, and these are the three species which I'm going to basically talk about today. So going back in time again, back say to the 19th century, Europeans did what pretty much any kind of modern Western kind of civilization did, and it basically fought a war against its large carnivores, using um, state subsidy, bounties, um, state employed hunters, and just about every method that you could think of from kind of poisoning to snaring to hunting to aerial gunning, we tried to exterminate these things from our landscape. And we nearly succeeded, but not quite. And then kind of following this um, ungulate kind of recovery of the early 20th century, by the mid 20th century, public attitudes began changing towards large carnivals. And pretty much everywhere in the 1950s, 1960s, policy changed. And suddenly, Kind of the, the, the society decided that maybe it's time to start conserving um, these species. So for the last 50 to 60 years, we have been in the era where the goal has to be bring these animals back, either through allowing them to increase or by um, actively reintroducing. So the context in which this has been happening is on a very fragmented context. Europe has like at least um, 37 countries where large carnivores have occurred and do occur. But even these countries um, underestimate the true scale of the administrative fragmentation because to many European countries are federal states where within themselves, they delegate authority down to different smaller regional levels, either counties or cantons um, or states. So in effect, we're looking at probably around 70 to 80 more or less sort of um, independent or semi-independent administrative units. And that is the landscape in which we're trying to conserve large carnivores, which as you know, move over huge areas and need large scale and coordination. Luckily, we have two pan-European bodies which have been guiding conservation. The first one you probably haven't heard so much about, and this is called the Council of Europe, which goes back to the 1970s. 
and has around 47 member states. Kind of Russia has a slightly ambiguous status. So let's just say kind of, kind of 46. But these guys introduced a convention in 1979 called the Bern Convention. It was the first of the international bodies of legislation mandating conservation of endangered wildlife. That was kind of followed up by the EU, which in 1992 created um, a directive called the Habitats Directive, which again afforded kind of protection to wildlife species. And in, in many ways is the equivalent of the Endangered Species Act. So these two kind of bodies of legislation have been given, kind of, kind of giving a guiding, slightly coordinating hand to the continental effort to achieve carnivore conservation. Even though the authority to implement that is then passed down to the member states, which then may in turn pass that down to their subnational entities. So you do get quite a lot of diversity in the way different countries and regions can go about trying to achieve common goals. But there is still this kind of unifying factor there which is driving it. So kind of from the start of the Bern Convention in 79, we really have been in this era of like what 50 years now of coordinating efforts to try to conserve large carnivores. And large carnivores have been very much one of the centerpieces of these bodies of um, legislation. So if we look at what happened, um, the next three slides are going to be maps for different species. And the map on the left will be the situation at around the midpoint of the 20th century, which is pretty much like the low point for everything. Um, the map on the right is the status in 2016. So if we look at, say, brown bears, for example, then can we can see that there has been fairly modest expansions. Um, it hasn't been anything totally dramatic, but you can see each of the areas that had bears in the 50s still has bears, and the area of distribution has expanded. The only place where they've um, appeared where they were totally gone is if you can see the mouse pointing here over the Alps, where bears have actually been reintroduced into northern Italy and parts of Austria. Otherwise, it's been the sort of a slow expansion of the existing populations. And that simply reflects bears. The, the, the bears do have very slow um, dispersal um, skills so that they, they do typically just expand slowly and incrementally. But the density has expanded. And today we probably have around 17,000 brown bears in Europe, which is way more than you have in Alaska and the, the Rocky Mountains combined. Um, moving on to the Eurasian lynx, the picture in the 1950s was actually pretty bad. Huge areas were empty of lynx. And today, if you're looking at the picture on the right, the, the, certainly the picture has changed. That the existing and surviving um, populations have expanded. And what is totally new is that this whole area of Central Europe, in kind of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, France, everything here suddenly has lynx again and also down here in the, the Balkans, all because of a whole series of reintroduction projects that started in the 1970s and are ongoing today. But this is probably the species where humans have been the most instrumental in assisting their kind of recovery. When it comes to wolves, the situation is pretty kind of dramatic. In 1950s, they were basically exterminated from everywhere in Northern and Central Europe. And there has been no active reintroduction of wolves, but at the moment they have returned to every single mainland European country has wolves. We're even facing um, a situation today when we have wolves breeding in the Netherlands and Denmark. And certainly 20 years ago, nobody would have thought for a second that we'd start seeing breeding wolves in the Netherlands. So this entire recovery has expanded throughout the Central Europe, the Alps, large parts of Poland, Norway and Sweden, large parts of Finland have been recolonized. So it's been an incredible situation where wolves have really done everything they can to regain an entire continent. At the moment, we estimate we probably have around 17,000 wolves in Europe. Um, just to look at some of the trends in some of the populations, for example, the top left shows Scandinavia, where wolves have kind of been going up. The one on the top right is probably the most spectacular. It was a number of wolf packs in Germany, 
Um, up until 1999, there were almost none. And then one or two packs started breeding. And then from 2016, on this graph, it was up to 60 packs. Today, it's probably up to around 130 packs breeding in Germany. And Germany is sort of not exactly known for its kind of wilderness. It's sort of has the same type of kind of population density and kind of uh, and landscape as say a state like maybe Connecticut or Maryland, actually, even though it's about the same size as um, Arizona. And the wolf numbers are just increasing every year, nearly exponentially. Same thing's been happening in the western part of Poland, also France and Italy, everything is going up. But these animals are really showing what happens if you give them a chance, that they can expand and they can recolonize a, a continent, even one as human dominated as Europe. Um, it's not always a kind of a, an immediate kind of success. This just illustrates the um, IUCN red list status of some of the populations. And just to point out that even though the overall trend is large, uh, sorry, is increasing, we still have some small populations, especially of brown bear and lynx, which are highly endangered. Um, the EN stands for endangered, the CR for critically endangered. But these are small, isolated populations, which are probably numbering between 10 and 100 individuals, which still need active help to come back. So the picture is not a booming success everywhere, but overall, things are doing really well, especially kind of wolves. Um, people always ask, you know, oh, where do these wolves live in Europe? You know, because people think of Europe as being this sort of, you know, kind of domesticated, cultivated, urbanized landscape. And they always think, ah, that they must live in the Norse, right? And that's kind of not true because kind of Norway, where I live, is a bit like the European equivalent of, say, Alaska. You know, it's big, it's empty. And we have a political objective set by our parliament of only allowing four to six wolf packs inside Norway. Irrespective of how many hundred we could have, they said, no, that's enough for us. We don't have room for any more. Germany, on the other hand, um, actually are today up to 130. So this uh, number is slightly out of date now. So, and Germany, like I say, is not exactly that big and empty, but they have totally different wolf and policies. So, for example, this is a picture of wolf habitat in Spain. And Spain has probably between two and two and a half thousand wolves. Most of them are living in landscapes like that. Those little three dots that you can see down here are actually wolves living in a landscape which is basically consisting of maize plantations and sugarcane fields. So this is just an ultimate example as to what wolves are capable of living in and thriving and actually creating an awfully few conflicts. Um, Germany is something I've been speaking about kind of quite a lot. It was a very urbanized landscape. And some of the areas where wolves first kind of came back consisted of these open cast and coal mine landscapes. Totally trashed out habitat, but an awful lot of wild prey. And for the wolves, this was uh, heaven where they actually started out and colonized. Um, so it's often counterintuitive that the, the high numbers are not necessarily in the wild northern areas. They can actually be very much in the central and southern European areas, which are even more human dominated than those up north. Nothing is entirely logical when you get into a human dominated landscape. Um, the context of European carnival conservation is essential because I would guess most people who read about wolf conservation have probably started out reading something about kind of Yellowstone, where everything is set in this kind of wilderness frame and this natural ecosystem processes and the only goal and the only baseline of the ecosystem is to preserve wilderness where kind of humans are guests and they, they leave only footprints. The European context is totally different, which is why most of what's written about wolf conservation is largely irrelevant for a European context, because we're not conserving wolves in a wilderness. We're conserving wolves in what is essentially a rural landscape where people, they live, they work, they play. It's a landscape which has an awfully rich cultural history attached to it, where we're not trying to separate people and nature, 
but where we're trying to conserve nature in a cultural context. And often where the benchmark for nature conservation is not an untouched wilderness, but it's a highly modified cultural type of nature that we value. For example, things like hay meadows are an incredibly bio kind of diverse habitat with a very rich cultural history attached to them and a very strong aesthetic component. Totally artificial, but very actively conserved. And this could be extended pretty much to the entire European landscape. So it really is a place where nature and culture are intertwined. Um, this really affects the way that we perceive nature, the way that we do nature conservation, and the type of objectives that we set for nature conservation. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on how you, you look at it, this landscape is undergoing dramatic changes right now. That the social changes of kind of the globalization are really hitting the European landscape and especially the rural people awfully hard. So that rural life is changing. People are moving to urban areas. Kind of rural people are losing their power. They're losing their predictability. They're losing their self-esteem. They're losing their traditions. And then these new values are coming back into the landscape, right? These kind of the views of kind of kind of, uh, kind of modernity. And this is challenging an awful lot of the traditional lifestyles linked to farming, to hunting and, and forestry and rural life in general. And then on top of this, these carnivores start to come back. And this kind of timing of the large carnivores returning at the same time as so many other challenging changes happen is what creates a recipe for a fairly major conflict. So that this cartoon I think kind of shows it all that kind of a wolf comes back and depending on your point of view, this could be viewed as something fantastic or something terrible. It could be viewed as a tremendous nature conservation success story, or it could be viewed as the undoing of generations of work trying to exterminate these animals once and for all. And if the person hearing that kind of wolf howling is a person in a fairly unstable, unpredictable, uncertain situation, trying to work out how to deal with change, then it can make that sound even more threatening and actually magnify the perception of the problem way beyond what it actually really is. And it's gonna bring this into then this whole issue of human wildlife conflicts. Because even though the carnivores have kind of returned, they have brought wisdom, many, many old conflicts and many, many new conflicts. I think it helps to break the conflicts down into two types, right? We have the, re the real conflicts, which happen with the real carnivores, and then we have these more social conflicts, which are more linked to the symbolism of the return of carnivores. So it's not so much kind of the wolf being a wolf, but it's just the idea of the wolf and what it actually kind of represents. So very quickly, I'm just going to zoom through a few slides, which try to break down these conflict ideas uh, into slightly more into greater detail because I think it's really important to understand the um, the issues going on around managing this kind of conservation success. So the conflict kind of zero, which I call it, is simply this conflict of expectation that many people living in Europe do not expect the European landscape to be home for wolves and bears. That for generations they've grown up where these animals have been gone. And they watch the uh, um, Animal Planet and Discovery Channel where they see wolves in Alaska or wolves in Yellowstone. The wolves belong in the wilderness. And suddenly when a wolf turns up in your farmland or in your village, people think something is wrong. And they think, well, how did it get there? And of course, all these conspiracy theories come about illegal reintroduction and so on. But really, it just boils down to this question of expectation that TV has given people an expectation which simply is not true. Wolves do not need wilderness. Wolves just need a few trees and some prey to kill and people just leave them alone. Wilderness is simply the places they ended up when humans pushed them back, but they do not need it. They are not symbols of wilderness. They're just as much symbols of farmland as anything else. 
So I think communicating the expectation that the European landscape is actually suitable habitat is probably the most fundamental thing we have to do. And this mismatch between what people see and what people thought is one of the sources of many conflicts. So then we get down to the more normal conflicts. We have these conflicts of substance, and these are kind of the economic ones, right? Um, it's things like livestock being killed. Um, it's things like beehives being destroyed kind of by bears. It's things like, um, yeah, so this is an example. Every year in Europe, over 20,000 sheep are being killed um, by wolves. So this can be quite a big conflict. But I think the graph here shows that the conflict is very unevenly can, can spread. So, for example, in Norway every year, each wolf is maybe killing up to 35 sheep. When you come down to Central Europe, they're probably killing one or two each. So there's a huge asymmetry in the extent of which our conflict is played out. But certainly it's a big conflict and it's a big driver of many other conflicts and a source of many fairly bloody pictures of dead sheep and things. What is probably more emotional is the killing of dogs. And wolves seem to have a very strong habit of unkilling hunting dogs. And this creates a fairly strong emotional conflict, which um, certainly drives media and public opinion quite a lot. In Northern Europe, we have a fairly special conflict with the Sami, who are viewed as an indigenous people, and their lifestyle is tied to the herding of our domestic reindeer. And in Northern Europe, the only prey for large carnivores is actually domestic reindeer. So this sort of is a fairly complicated conflict where carnival conservation and indigenous people's rights clashes head on. Um, it's one of the most intractable conflicts that we have to face because there really are very few solutions. But those are kind of the easy to understand conflicts, right? They're kind of carnivores who kill livestock and dogs. Um, the issue of fear is also quite important. The kind of, kind of European fairy tales are full of the dangerous wolf and innocent children being killed. And it's been very hotly contested um, as to what extent wolves actually are a danger to people. To cut it really down to the basics, our historical documents certainly document that in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, hundreds of people were being killed every year by wolves. So this is not something growing out of fairy tales. It's a case of where fairy tales were actually representing real danger. And this is probably one of the biggest um, differences between, say, North American and European construction of wolves, is that we are much more embracing the fact that historically, at least, these animals were dangerous. Um, that being said, in the last kind of 50 years, um, we haven't had any fatal cases of wolf attacks at all. So they are situations, or they, they are risks that were linked to certain um, situations that were much more widespread in the past and are much less unpleasant today. Um, the other conflicts are much more social, right? Uh, we have a huge conflict over knowledge. Who has the facts, the scientists or the lay people? And this started out very much sort of as a fairly innocent sort of this form of kind of um, rural kind of resistance and a sort of a, an anti-elitism. But in the modern world, this has become known as kind of fake news and alternative facts and that we're now living in the post-fact era. And what you see now is that actually is not simply misunderstandings, but there's a whole carefully constructed set of fake news, fake information, and actually a fake reality being spread by people who are cynically and deliberately trying to increase the perceptions of fear, trying to increase the, the idea that all wolves are hybrids and so on. So knowledge has become very much just one more tool in a culture war. And it's not just linked to wolves, right? This is the whole, you know, can Trump story, we have it going on with, with vaccines and climate change. But this is really becoming one of the emerging conflict arenas is simply over who has the facts. Um, Values and norms are a huge issue. The values behind wolf conservation often come into direct conflict with the more traditional rural values, like as I'm talking about earlier. People simply think wolves and bears do not belong in our modern world. Many people think they do, many people think they don't. And this kind of battle over simply is it right or wrong 
where should the animals be is one of the major emerging conflict lines. Um, other conflicts quickly are linked to procedures. Um, administration and legislation can enable conservation and they can hinder conservation. If they are enforced in a corrupt way, if they're enforced in an overly strict way, um, if they're enforced by a distant authority rather than a local authority, can certainly influence the way that kind of legislation and administration is perceived as being building or shrinking conflicts. Um, I think we can move on. There's never to underestimate, though, the extent to which a conflict over a wolf can enter mainstream politics and that it can become instrumentalized as a symbol in a wider political struggle between you know, left wing and right wing politics or modern or, or traditional ideologies. And simply these poor carnivals just get sucked up and held up and used and abused in political struggles which have nothing to do with carnivals at all, but their symbolism is really hijacked by everybody for their own purpose, which is really quite a sad state of affairs. Um, just to begin rounding off, even though we have these conflicts, carnivals are doing well. They're booming back. So the question is, what is going to limit it? Where will it stop? Like today, if say can Germany has what 130 wolf packs, where's it going to end? And I don't think anyone knows. Certainly, habitat is not kind of limiting. Europe has space to double, triple quadruple is number of wolves and bears and lynx. Um, and that is without one centimeter of wilderness out there. That's simply in this kind of modern um, cultural landscape. The things which are going to be, be limiting are certainly the, the issue of conflict and tolerance. How much are people willing to accept over how wide areas? And I guess it will also depend on the ability of our institutions and agencies to actually manage them. So certainly it will not be anything ecological which sets a goal here, or which sets a limit. It will be certainly social and political factors. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to skip over. So if there are limits, I'm sure there are, but I certainly don't think it's anything that we should try to define in advance. That this is a process which has been running for 50, 60 years, and it needs to continue to run. And we'll have to play it by ear. And at some point we'll be deciding, okay, this has gone too far, or maybe we have to go back a bit, or maybe we can still can push it further. But I don't think it helps to really define in advance where we actually want it to end. We have to get there because in human history, we've never actually tried it before. You never actually tried to share our continent with large carnivores. Because for history, we've basically been trying to exterminate them. And it was only at the end that we actually had the means to actually, actually bring it about. So we have, we're going into unplowed or unexplored territory here, trying to build a sustainable relationship with these species in a shared space. And nobody has the blueprint for how that's going to look. But I think the way that we talk about it and the way that we talk about this blueprint or the lack of it has a massive effect on how the conflicts are actually going to play out. So kind of example, um, there are many approaches to talking about conservation and especially talking about conservation goals that we can talk about kind of conservation as kind of wilderness and rewilding or compassionate conservation, or we can talk about ecosystem services and, sust and sustainability and wildlife management and restoration. And at the moment, conservation is full of all of these different paradigms and competing ideologies for how we should go about conservation and what conservation should be trying to achieve. And this is not simply an academic game because the way that you portray conservation will certainly influence the public understanding of it and the public perception of conflict. So for example, if we come to a European public and we start talking about wilderness and rewilding in a landscape where people are living as farmers and foresters and they have their villages and their hiking trails and their jogging routes and their dog walking routes and their kids' football fields. And you start talking about wilderness, 
it doesn't fit. It has nothing to do with the lifestyle of the people living in that place and the landscape where those are, a, a, a carnivores are being conserved. You start talking about sustainability and wildlife management, or you start talking about biocultural conservation and novel ecosystems, and then people get it. Ah, so this is about compromise. Ah, okay, that makes sense. So the way that you frame things matters. But at the moment, there's a war within the conservation of competition with everybody trying to push their ideology and their framing ahead, both for academic credit and for, for funding. What is a problem too is that many of these things are totally incompatible with each other. But this is sort of this attempt just to show how these different, say, conservation strategies can actually be combined and not. And things like, say, animal rights and compassionate uh, and conservation are basically incompatible with everything else. They're their own little thing which do not fit in any um, incarnation of can the, can the reality that we actually deal with. A whole bunch of things like wildlife management and ecosystem services and uh, novel ecosystems and restoration ecology, they fit together in a fairly coherent kind of package, which also align with, say, global policy objectives like the sustainable de de development goals. Conservation biology kind of sits a little bit on the edge of that. It can contribute sometimes or not, depending on how far it drifts over to the other side, where things like wilderness and rewilding and compassionate conservation come in. And these things can maybe find a relevance in some protected areas, to maybe the core zones of some national parks in some places, but largely they are irrelevant for around 95% of the European landscape. And it is in that 95% of the landscape where the carnivores are being conserved. And it's there that we need to look at these conservation strategies, which much more are built around the integration of people and nature into a sort of a complicated interactive um, relationship where the, the goal is to have a sustainable interaction, not some type of hands off, let it do its own thing. So it's very important then how we frame the objectives of our conservation and really show that people matter when we're doing conservation in a human dominated landscape. So there, I think I will end it. Um, just wanted to maybe leave this last slide here, which is a, a website of an expert group on large carnival conservation active in Europe. And there you have an awful lot of the technical background and the type of stuff that we have been working with over the last um, 30 years. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Uh, so there have been uh, some questions in the Q&A, and I will ask you this question, these questions uh, as I can. So the first one is, uh, did any large carnivores go extinct? And if so, how many and what has been the impact of their extinction? No. So in Europe, we have not lost um, a large carnivore since probably sometime back in the Ice Age. So when we used to have lions and leopards and hyenas, but that was when there was a totally different ecosystem. That was when it was like kind of um, kind of Arctic steppe and this type of stuff. So, and this all happened a long time ago. So certainly probably for the last maybe seven, 8,000 years, we have not lost any large carnivores. Uh, I have other questions. So it was about uh, the number of wolf packs uh, there is in Norway and in Germany. And the mm. questions are, why are only four to six wolf packs allowed in Norway? What is the government reserving the land for future mm. development or population growth? And how is Norway regulating the packs? Norway is kind of the outlier here. Um, I would guess kind of in a North American context, they're like the Wyoming or the Alaska, I would guess. And that sort of, it's a country dominated by fairly traditionalistic um, attitudes um, based very much upon the exploitation of natural resources. And wolves, are simply viewed as not belonging. Um, it's largely the sheep grazing lobby, but also the reindeer herding lobby, the hunting lobby, and simply many rural people who express fear 
So the public are certainly in favour of wolves. Any opinion poll will tell you, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of the public in the rural areas and the cities are in favour. But the lobby power of this kind of traditional kind of land use group has, has got so much power that they simply are able to create this kind of reality where wolves don't belong and are able to get parliament behind them. And the wolves simply get caught up in some horse trading between political issues and simply get unsacrificed. So that the four to six is basically just you know, the smallest number you can have that's not zero. It's pure and utter politics. Um, completely out of touch with the, the rest of Europe. When it comes to how is largely maintained by hunting. Um, and if the hunters are not efficient enough, then the state actually go in and shoot wolves from helicopter. So it's not exactly something to be proud of, let's say. That is really interesting to see the difference between the countries. Uh, so there are other questions uh, from Rachel Mason, which is from England. And she said, very interesting talk for someone who grew up in the countryside in Europe. So her question is, you talked a lot about conflicts, but can you give any examples of rural communities that have welcomed the carnivores? Mm. That's a really good question. And um, it's a thing that I, I think all of us fall into the trap of is that because kind of conflicts tend to be loud, we actually tend to talk about them all the time and that we often ignore the silent um, ones who are happy. Right, so I think today, one of the large carnivore species is found on something like 50 or 60% of the European landscape. And for most people living in that landscape, it's actually perfectly okay. Now they, they either don't mind, or they actively like it, or if they don't like it, it doesn't have any effect on them compared to other things. So most people in most places who are sharing space with them actually are perfectly happy with it, either indifferent or happy. So I would say that we have sort of millions of examples of people who are willing to go along with this conservation and plan as long as, you know, if a bear does something dangerous, somebody intervenes or something. So that we have some type of intervention. Um, but in general, people accept it. It's just that some very loud voices manage to come up and dominate this kind of this, um, conflict picture. And unfortunately, these voices tend to be very powerful in politics. So that the very hot conflict that we see does not represent the very strong public support that you have across Europe. It's sort of also probably, I guess, important to underline what we actually mean by support. And that in most areas which have a long, you know, say, tradition of coexisting with bears and wolves, very few of the shepherds or the farmers or the foresters would say, I love wolves or I love bears. And they don't join WWF or Greenpeace and protest about it. But for them, it's normal. A wolf or bear, yeah, it belongs. In the same way that a tree belongs or a wild boar belongs, it just belongs. So it's sort of very important, I think, to don't expect people to love these things. It's just to accept them and to accept that they belong. And that really, I think, is your benchmark of kind of success. And it is very widespread. But just unfortunately, those quiet voices do not make it past the minorities who are very active in expressing conflict. Thank you. Um, she also asked, uh, she noticed that uh, wild boars are present in most Europe, and there is just a small pocket in southeast England, and she wonders how they went then. Um, I think they escaped from a farm. Okay, so it was kind of uh, accidental reintroduction. Mm. Okay. I think so, yes. <laughs> Uh, I have another question. So thank you for the interesting talk. Could you please talk a little bit more about how this increases in large mammal populations relate to land use and habitat changes? Are new land uses also changing the way that people are interacting with wildlife? And also, if time, uh, are these changes in land use telecouple to international factors? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a question of time scale. 
that if we go back to the late 19th and early 20th century, certainly the lightening of the human impact on the European landscape at that time was instrumental to allowing the recovery of, first of all, large herbivores and then carnivores. Um, the more recent changes that we hear and read about in the last 20 to 30 years, I think are much less important because most of these species actually don't really mind living in a kind of mosaic landscape with kind of some human land use, some forestry, some wild land. So this kind of transition that we're seeing, especially in, in South Europe now, where whole districts are being abandoned, is not really making much of a, a difference. What we do see, though, is a bit of a paradox here, is that when all the people move out of these kind of wilder, mountainous areas, it's not, it doesn't mean that land is actually abandoned. Land is still there, it's still owned by a person, but that person is not there. So suddenly they don't really care what happens to it. And what you see now is a huge expansion of say wind farms and hydropower projects and uh, uh, things like that moving in to previously abandoned landscapes. And there's no one there to protest anymore. So no one minds if a wind farm goes up. So what we do see is that the people moving out, there may be a temporary respite, but other interests move in and they will be much more detrimental to our life than actually what the people were doing before moving out. So I, I think there's a need for an awful lot of nuance around the, the effects of these ongoing changes in human land use. Thank you. Uh, I see a question which has been asked twice. Yes, so what are your thoughts about uh, the re reintroducing lynx and wolves to the UK as currently debated? <laughs> Ooh, um, certainly lynx and probably wolves would do very well in Britain. Um, like there's, there's no reason that they wouldn't survive there and, and thrive. Um, but the conflict that it would cause on an island which has completely forgotten how to live with large animals like this would be astronomical. Um, because like you have an awful lot of, of agriculture. Um, a Scotland is full of sheep. Um, the UK is full of sheep and other livestock and so it would be a very interesting case study but it would be very conflictful because also the, the British public is very animal friendly so you would have certainly a huge majority of people who are dramatically en enthusiastic you would have some rural people who were incredibly distressed and the conflict between these two things would be much bigger than the conflict, for example, over fox hunting, which um, Britain has faced in the last kind of decade. So it would be a, a, certainly a starting point for a massive rural urban conflict. Um, and what the conservation benefits of it would be, I'm not too sure. So it would be highly symbolic if um, Britain took on that step. The carnivores would probably do well, but it would be conflictful. And that conflict may well take the focus away from other areas of nature conservation where Britain is making a global impact on helping things which are really important. With having a few extra wolves and lynx in Britain wouldn't really help the global lynx and wolves kind of conservation effort much. So it's a very complex un un trade off. Um, and if people do it, they should certainly do it with their eyes open, aware of the fact that it will be conflictful. Okay, thank you so much. This is really interesting to see again this difference between all the countries and uh, how people will receive it. Uh, I have an interesting question. Uh, so you have talked with respect to wolves, uh, with respect to rewilding and reintroductions, giving rise to conflicts, but mm -hmm. Users conflict types uh, can be applicable to other carnivores and in other ge geographical areas, and especially if the carnivores are existing in the wild. For example, mm. 
tiger conflicts uh, conflicts in Asia. And I know you worked a bit mm. in Asia too. Yeah. No, this is a really interesting question. Um, and I think it's kind of one of the, the frustrations lying at the heart of conservation as a science, because in science, we love to be able to predict, right? We love to be able to find the rules, right? The rules in ecology, which allow us to predict from one context to the next. And conservation kind of frustrates that because everything is so context dependent. You know, it's so tied up into local history, culture, religion, social economic situations. And even just like within the Europe, I tried to show that it's very difficult to predict where things are going to work and where things aren't are going to work. Um, and it's the same internationally. So thinking about Asia, there are places where things work really well, you know, and species that do quite well. Like we do hear kind of quite a lot about snow leopards, but in general, snow leopards seem to be living in most of their previous range at numbers which seem to be fairly healthy. So even though they need constant conservation attention, they're doing quite well. Um, if you say, think about places like India, our leopards are doing incredibly well. Um, they are kind of recolonizing farmland. They are moving into suburban and even urban areas. So that is kind of probably a, a good kind of parallel to some of the, the European stories is how, how well can the leopards do. Um, even tigers are increasing in India. So it's sort of amazing things happen. But then you can say cross the uh, arm over into Myanmar, which has a much lower human population density, much more forest, loads of habitat. And you really struggle to find a, a large carnivore because virtually everything has been killed. And even though the people are Buddhist, that doesn't stop them from either eating it themselves or anything they can't eat, they sell over the border into China. So again, it's sort of an example of how difficult it is to predict where India, which doesn't have much habitat, has lots of wildlife. Myanmar, which has more habitat, doesn't have it. So we have both kind of success stories and failure stories everywhere we actually look. So prediction is very, very challenging. Thank you, John. No problem. My pleasure.